Hi, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Melithi Fernando, and I had the pleasure of managing the 2021 edition of the Transport Outlook. My presentation today is a bird's eye view. It gives an overview of the entire transport sector and our main findings and draws from the first and second chapters of the report. So you can take a look there if you'd like more details. We'll start off with a quick summary of the three policy scenarios that we model in this publication. They represent three different levels of ambition when it comes to decarbonizing transport. The first, recover, looks at a return to our current policy trajectory. It tracks where we would be in a few decades if governments follow through on all implemented and announced policies from before the pandemic. Apart from that, we essentially return to pre-pandemic life. Reshape offers a completely different trajectory. The commitments coming out of the pandemic are transformational, and there's a focus on green recovery that goes far beyond original commitments. Reshape Plus, we identify where travel behavior and economic stimulus could be leveraged to boost policies in reshape after the pandemic. It front loads the implementation of these policies during the recovery period. Now, what I mean by leveraging travel behavior is encouraging trends seen during the pandemic, such as increased walking and cycling or teleconferencing instead of business travel. First off, we'll take a look at where the transport sector is headed in terms of demand for travel and the resulting emissions. These are the results of our recover scenario. And after that, we'll spend some time looking at policy recommendations. Starting off with demand, under our current level of policy ambition, we expect the demand for passenger travel and the movement of goods to more than double between 2015 and 2050. The dip in 2020 is temporary and we're already seeing pre-pandemic levels of traffic in some areas. Much of the growth in passenger travel and freight demand is driven by population growth and increasing prosperity around the world. This is compounded to a certain extent because the regions experiencing the highest levels of population growth are also the regions of rapid economic growth. What does this mean for greenhouse gas emissions? Well, measured as the equivalent CO2 emissions, we estimate that the transport sector will see a 16% growth in emissions by 2050. This would overshoot the level needed to have a chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees by about three times. Of course, when looking at global warming, the total emissions are what matters. But when it comes to identifying where responsibility may lie in generating these emissions and now leading the charge to decarbonize the sector, we see a strong correlation between the world regions that generate the highest GDP per capita and where individuals emit the most transport emissions. The good news is that these are also the world regions with the capital and the technological means to take a leading role in reducing emissions. Now, how do we move from this fairly grim picture of where we are headed to what is possible with strong commitments and more importantly, action? How do you create a transport system that's more sustainable and more equitable? Well, we have six insights for policymakers to reshape their transport systems in this very unique time in history. First off, we need to raise ambition to reverse CO2 emission growth. This graph shows clearly with the dark blue line there that if we stick to our current efforts, it is not enough to hit the CO2 reductions needed by 2030 and 2050 which would be compatible with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. As countries are revising their commitments this year to the Paris Agreement, there is a chance to do things differently. Under a reshape type policy scenario, we have a chance of just about meeting these carbon targets. But reshape plus, shown here in the green line, 
which seeks to front load and further leverage opportunities during recovery from the pandemic, it offers a chance to meet these objectives sooner and with more certainty. It achieves a 70% reduction in emissions by 2050. These environmental ambitions need to be aligned with COVID-19 recovery policies to ensure that the economy recovers and policies to create more equitable systems than before. Focusing on one at the expense of another will essentially mean one step forward and two steps back. Now, why do we need to do this? Well, let's look, take a look at the status quo. Within countries, inequality is growing. These are the kinds of inequalities people see day to day and experience. The causes and consequences of climate change are also unequally distributed. Wealthier countries and individuals have had a historically higher carbon footprint, while the people suffering the consequences of climate change are very low emitters. Inequalities extend to transport access as well. It has a huge impact on people's well being. Those that are well off have higher transport access and therefore access to greater opportunities in life while vulnerable groups in both developing and developed regions may be limited in the types of jobs that they can access. They may not be able to get to healthy food or health care. They may experience isolation, all because of these poor transport systems. COVID-19 has exacerbated many of the economic losses, especially for those in precarious jobs. And those that rely on public transport stand to lose one of the only forms of transport available to them if public transport is not prioritized as we emerge from this crisis. So what's the solution? We believe it is aligned action. Our results and recommendations from this outlook are a contribution to this. First off, the policy measures we look at, they tackle decarbonization, so from an environmental perspective. But beyond that, they also help job creation, they help improve the economic efficiency of cities and connect people to these jobs. From a social perspective, many measures focus on improving access for groups like children, older people, women, people with mobility restrictions, whose travel needs have been poorly catered to in our existing systems. We also highlight where some decarbonization measures, especially those, involving pricing, need to be considered with an understanding of the local context and exactly who will be affected, how and to what extent, to ensure that they are implemented fairly and effectively. One of the most important ways to align these goals is to move from mobility-focused policies to accessibility-focused policies. What do we mean by this? Accessibility-focused policies ensure that people have access to opportunities and goods without putting the focus on traveling more or traveling faster. It's good for people, it's good for the environment, and it makes good economic sense. These are the policies to encourage denser neighborhoods where you can work, send your kids to school, shop, meet friends, and when you do need to go elsewhere in your region or in the city, you can easily access a transport hub where you can use public transport or shared mobility if that's more appropriate, using a variety of other sustainable modes, ideally walking, cycling, scooters. Some of us got a glimpse of this during the pandemic as we walked and cycled more and our trips stayed closer to home. Wouldn't it be convenient if all our errands were also easier to complete close by? This is very different to the mobility focused private car centric model that has been traditionally used in transport planning. It leads to building more and wider roads, inducing more and more car traffic. These principles of accessibility apply also to freight. Moving from longer supply chains and faster transport to consolidating loads and shorter, more resilient supply chains. Accessibility focused policies help to reduce travel demand, but to a different extent based on sector. We see here the difference in demand 
in 2050 for each sector under the current policy trajectory and our most ambitious scenario. In cities, accessibility-focused policies have a significant impact lowering demand. People travel 22% less. Freight as well achieves an 18% reduction in activity through shortened supply chains, asset sharing, consolidation of loads, and so on. In regional and intercity travel, or non-urban passenger transport, demand reduction is very difficult. Lower volumes of people are traveling over longer distances. This is especially true for regional travel between rural areas and between rural areas and cities. Much of the demand reduction we see overall for this sector is actually due to reduction in air travel between cities in our most ambitious scenario. So it is important to realize that the types of measures we apply to different sectors will depend on their unique characteristics. Regional differences will also come into play. My colleagues will be going into the sector specific details in the following sessions, but for now, generally speaking, traveling outside of cities where possible should be shifted to cleaner modes, such as rail. But globally, the largest benefit we see in terms of just the CO2 reduction comes from cleaner technology. And this applies to trucks, buses, cars, all motorized transport. However, we don't yet have the ability to shift completely away from fossil fuel based technologies. We do need more development to decarbonize the sector. We need to invest in developing new fuels and vehicles that are affordable and available quickly. We need to encourage their adoption by providing financial incentives and investing in public charging infrastructure. It is crucial that we target shared and high use vehicle fleets, such as delivery vehicles, buses, shared mobility, so we can reap the most benefits compared to just private cars. Lastly, improvements don't need to be in vehicles and fuels alone. We can already optimize operations through data sharing and digitalization so that, for example, by having access to real-time information, you can use the most efficient route. This is immense benefits for both passenger travel and freight transport. Last of all, in order to achieve any of the policy strategies mentioned before, we need to seek out greater collaboration outside of the transport sector and even within its more disparate parts. Moving to clean transport means relying on alternative energy sources. So if you have an electric bus fleet, you're not going to be truly zero emission unless your electricity grid is also based on renewable energy. Sectors such as trade and tourism are deeply connected to the transport industry. And during the pandemic, we saw very clearly what an important economic role tourism plays. To ensure the long-term sustainability of the industry, sustainable transport will be central. The private and public sector collaboration is becoming increasingly important as new mobility services are introduced from the private sector. We need to boost their social benefits, but keep the environmental and social costs in check, which requires closer relationships with public authorities. And bringing us back all the way to the point on accessibility, land use and transport planning must be integrated to achieve greater access to opportunities without forcing people to travel more. In closing, of the six policy takeaways that we have discussed, at the very least, the four to walk away with today are number one, we need to increase ambition. We are not headed in the right direction with our existing policies. Two, we need to align economic recovery with these decarbonization initiatives and those to create more equitable transport systems. We can achieve this by focusing on access to opportunities and not more travel. And beyond that, we will need to rely on further technological development to move away from fossil fuel dependency. The longer we wait to make these changes, the harder and more drastic they will need to be to limit global warming. And we are at a very unique time in history. As we recover from this global crisis 
and as countries are revising their commitments to the Paris Agreement targets, the transport outlook shows that we have a chance, if we act now, to reshape transport for a cleaner environment and fairer societies. 